Well, it's 6.30, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, so um, I realize that there might be some people that might be still coming in, but I want to make sure to respect everyone's time. Um, as we get started, I want to do a quick sound check. Can everyone hear me okay? And can everyone see the PowerPoint? I'm sorry, Yes, it is. I know I have to get on I'll repeat myself one more time. Can everybody see the PowerPoint okay? And can everybody hear me okay? Try it one more time. Can everybody hear me and see the PowerPoint okay? Yes. Thank you. All right. Uh, at this time, please make sure to mute your microphone. Uh, you can unmute it at any time to participate in the discussion. It helps uh, cut down on the background noise. Um, so welcome to our live session uh uh so here's a, tonight's overview of what we are going to cover um in this live session we'll have our introduction portion i will go over live classroom expectations uh important reminders check-ins from week one takeaways uh field experience reports the planning cycle observation record methods writing learning objectives uh the comprehensive lesson planning and then you guys will have time for uh questions and answers uh if you do have questions in uh this live session um since it's only it looks like a few of us tonight to go ahead and ask them um i will probably ask you almost after each powerpoint if you have any questions just to make sure that you comprehend the material All right, so as most of you guys know, um, my name is Mike Hager and I currently reside in Denver, Colorado. I have a master's degree in early childhood education and work as an administrator for Head Start. Um, so if time and money were no issue, uh, I would love to travel to Brazil. My mom is originally from Brazil, and she talks about uh, how beautiful the country is. Uh, I would especially love visiting the gorgeous beaches um, during the winter months because it's summer there. Um, and as you guys know, especially I know a lot of you guys are from Minnesota, and I'm actually vis visiting North Dakota um, currently, right, in North Dakota right now. And I know how brutal those winters could be, um, sometimes not as brutal as uh, – Colorado is pretty tame comparing to North Dakota winters. Um, so, um, but yeah, it would be nice to go there during uh, January because that is their summer month. Um, but yeah, now I would uh, just like to invite you guys to share who you are, where you're from, um, the type of program you are in, and uh, if time and money were no object, where would you like to travel? Hi, my name is Susan DeBleek, and I'm from Minnesota. And the type of program I am in is I run a family child care in my house. And I guess I would stick to the United States because my husband just decided to like airplanes. So we're not traveling out of the United States yet. And we're looking, we're excited about planning a trip to California. 
Nice. Where in California? Well, he went on a business trip to Anaheim and liked it. So we thought we'll take the kids out. And my, I actually have five kids. And my next, my second oldest is thinking he'd like to go to college in California. So we figured maybe time to go out there and do a little exploring. Nice. A couple of years ago, we went to Anaheim for our first time. Uh, uh, we went to Disneyland and um, yeah. it was, it was fun. It was hot, but it, it was it was during the 4th of July. But yeah, it's a good time. I love yeah. California. I love the beaches, too. Well, thank you, Susan, and welcome. Thank you. Uh, it looks like... Uh, Anna's going to be using um, the chat box because her mic doesn't work. Uh, Anna is from Bogota, Colombia, and she is working on her associates for ECE, and she lives in the land of lakes of Florida. Thanks for sharing, Anna, and welcome to our live session. So, um, because it's only us two, we'll probably get through the live session a little bit quicker tonight, but I want to make sure that um, <clears throat> you guys do understand everything that is going uh, through here. Um, so uh, we have live classroom sessions, expectations I wanted to cover, um, especially for the people that are not um, with us tonight. Um, you are not with us to review the recording, but then you would have to um, answer uh, in a session the uh, quiz and complete all the questions that I would ask you guys to as well. So let me go over that a little bit. Uh, so in this course, we will have two live classroom sessions um, that I'll lead to expand on the current module topics. These sessions are offered in Module 2 and in Module 5. The next live session will be uh, Tuesday, July 30th at 6.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. The purpose of the live classroom session is to engage with your peers and, uh, and myself in conversation about the course concept to further your learning. Uh, interact classroom sessions encourage open and dialogue and questions are encouraged. Uh, for some reason, if you can't um, attend the live session, uh, like I said earlier, the video will be posted the next day and then you would have to complete a live session quiz to answer the questions that, that I asked the class um, during the actual presentation in order to receive uh, the full credit. Pretty straightforward. Do you guys have any questions at this time? All right. Nope. Perfect. Hearing and seeing that there's no questions, I'm going to keep moving on. Um, so important reminders. Uh, make sure that you guys look closely at the course calendar for due dates. Uh, I don't really want to deduct any points for late assignments, but the college policy does have a 10% deduction for each day that an assignment is late. And this does apply to Discussion posts as well. Uh, assignments are due by 11.59 p.m. Central Standard Time every Sunday. Initial discussion posts are due on 11.59 p.m. Central Standard Time uh, every Tuesday. And then uh, discussion responses to peers um, and myself are uh, need to be in by 11.59 p.m. every Saturday. Uh, for full credit in the discussions, please do respond to at least one peer as well as any questions I may ask you. Um, you are encouraged to respond to more than one peer. Um, and the questions other peers may ask you as well, just to expand on your learning. And then just really make sure to refer to the course calendar. Um, the calendar for Module 6 assignments and discussions, they're a little bit different. Um, everything uh, then is due by the last day of class, which is Tuesday, August 6th. 
um, and then no work will be accepted uh, after that date for any reason um, for policy, uh, college policy. I cannot um, accept anything after August 6th. So, um, having said that and everything that is going on, how is everything going for you guys? Um, how is uh, the information, any kind of new information that you took away from uh, Module 1? And are you guys able to navigate through Blackboard? And most importantly, the last thing I would like to ask, have you had a chance to be in your field experience observations and are there any barriers that are preventing you from completing that? Mine is all going just fine and I'm not having anything to prevent me from doing anything. And I enjoyed the step, the step in the first week of class. Perfect. I'm glad to hear that. So, Susan, have you took a class through Rasmussen before? I started in April. Oh, okay. So. so, yep. The first week was, I'm 40, so the first week was, let's remember what we're doing and stuff. I went to college for this a long time ago, but I didn't finish. So, I guess, as you can say, as, as my children are going off to college, I guess I'm doing mine. Yep. Okay. Perfect. Awesome. Well, that's good that you have that background information of um, already knowing kind of the platform with Blackboard. I know that Rasmussen sometimes offers CBE classes, which is a completely different platform, um, but Blackboard is a little, a little bit quicker. Um, there's actually assignments that you need to get done, you need to be done on time, which is nice. Um, instead of waiting for the last second, I know CBE courses say some, you have like multiple attempts, um, but I don't need to get into that. But yeah, uh, so yeah. Anyways, thanks for sharing. Uh, looks like Anna said that this quarter she started in a Montessori school and so far just summer kids and no, not too much work yet. All right, well, just make sure that you guys get those hours in um uh if you like i said if you guys are having trouble at all uh just make sure to reach out to me so we could uh work on something um to make sure that you complete that so you guys do pass the course uh field experience report so each module um there uh, each module field experience report will prompt you to focus on uh, key areas of practice. Uh, make sure to examine it early in each module to ensure that you know what you're focusing on on your upcoming field experiences. And then at the module, and then at the end of the module, you'll report on how many field experience hours you completed with a reflection on your experience. An overview. An overview of each module's key area of practice can be found in this slide right here below. Um, a reflection by its nature is very good, very personal experience. As such, there are really no right or wrong answers. Um, it's basically your opinion on what you believe. It is the habit of reflecting upon your effectiveness as an educator, uh, which is most important, consequently. Um, my feedback may be really brief, but um, in your written responses, just be sure to use complete sentences as well as proper punctuation and grammar. Do you guys have any questions regarding that field, the field experience? All right, Aaron, you're seeing that there are, I don't hear any questions. Um, I'm going to keep continuing on. We do have quite a lot to go over tonight. Um, so the planning cycle, time to dig into a little bit of the material. Um, 
So whenever you're doing the planning cycle, um, the first step uh, when you are planning um, is to identify what you're planning for. Um, you know, before planning a curriculum, it is, like I said, it's important to identify for whom you're planning. And some of the things that you want to really consider um, when you're identifying um, during the during the identifying during the planning cycle is what do you want to know about the child's development, uh, the progress, the development progress, the areas of growth, home life, and interest, and what do you want the child to do or learn as a result of the lesson? Really, 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 really important to think about those questions um, and understand that information so you could set attainable outcomes for the child um, as you develop your lessons. So that's kind of what you want to do at the very beginning is to really identify who you're planning for and what you want them to do as a result of the lesson. And then, you know, during making sure that you're gathering all that information, um, that important information, like areas of growth and home life and interest um, that is really, really valuable. The next thing you want to do is you want to plan. So now that you've identified the subject with some of the background information about the child's development progress, home life, interest, um, you can actually begin the planning. Uh, planning should include aspects such as, you know, materials needed, step-by-step -step instructions, um, transition and support strategies and environmental considerations. Uh, a lot of times writing out your plan is just a good way to help see how it will come together. So that's a little bit about the planning and then after you plan you want to implement. Implementation of your plan will only be effective if the child is actively engaged with your plan. Uh, so as we know that children learn through play, so free choice time during play-based learning is a great way for early childhood uh, education professionals to give opportunities for the child to investigate and discover skills and understanding and is a good way to help um, implement that lesson. Uh, the next thing that you would want to do is you want to observe, um, observing uh, and being really cognizant uh, while each activity unfold is really imperative of the rest of the cycle. Uh, we ask the question as professionals, what is working, what is not working, what learning is taking place, and how do I know? During your observation time, you should be taking a lot of notes of your observations. There are different ways for taking observations depending on what you're looking for in the behavior of the child. And we will discuss a little bit more on um, observations in the next slide. And the last thing that you wanna do, or actually it's not the last thing, but the next thing you wanna do is you wanna adjust and differentiate. Um, each lesson can always expand on growth. Um, as teachers, we just really need to reflect on how we can continue to meet the individual learning and development needs of the child. How can we adapt the lesson to ensure you accommodate diverse learners? And then finally, what are the next steps we can bridge the lesson authentically into the child's home and community? Uh, as we know, the learning process doesn't end at school, and it's our job to inform the parents, guardians of these children what we are doing um, in school so we can share this information with the parents at home. This does help the child master the outcome when there is a, a dual support of learning, both at school and home, which helps build the child's strength. Um, so could always scaffold their learning and make them grow. Uh, the next thing is assessing. Uh, to complete the planning, we must reflect on the lesson's effectiveness. First, were the learning outcomes met? And how do we know? What does the child know now? 
And what are the next steps in the child's development and learning goals? So when we're assessing, we want to make sure that we are asking those questions. Um, you know, that's one of the biggest things. What does the child know now? Um, and what can the child do and what are the next steps? And then the very last thing um, is repeating. Uh, you want to repeat the cycle and reflect. So what you could have changed so the lesson could have been more effective. Uh, maybe you didn't gather as much information on the child, like interests or family lifestyle. Uh, it's really important to get as much information as you can to meet those outcomes that are attainable for the child. Um, so now having said that, uh, my question to you, and if you are viewing this online, you will have to answer this in paragraph form. Um, do you uh, currently use the planning cycle as an ongoing process? And how do you think that will affect your teaching practices? Um, please answer these two questions uh, when you submit the live section part of your assignment. Uh, if you are viewing or if you are online right now, we can have a little discussion about it. Uh, Anna and uh, Susan, about what you think about um, the planning cycle as an ongoing process. I really like the planning cycle. Um, I find a lot of times when I'm looking to accomplish certain things, uh, like when I evaluate my kids, say if I have a child that's not too good at balancing, so I make sure I bring out the balance beam and I plan how I'm going to do it. Then I have one that is younger, so because I'm in family child care, so I have infants to um, you know, just about school age. And then I end up moving like the balance beam next to the wall or doing this or changing something or doing this. And then I always look back and say how I can do it different. And a lot of times I, with my personality, I end up doing it again almost right away just to uh, implement the changes I wished I would have had in there the first time. But I like it. Perfect. I'm reflecting on how we're, how we're, implementing our, you know, what we're trying to teach their play and everything like that. Nice. And Su Susan, with your, is it hard? Uh, I think I was, might have asked you this question before. Um, having, you said you had infants all the way up to school age. As far as like ratios and stuff, um, I'm sure you probably can't have more than a few children at your house. But is is it hard? So when, when you have to, to, when you're doing a certain curriculum or an activity, how do you make it a, a how do you make it hit all the different age ranges? Yeah, yeah. It, it took me a lot of getting used to. I'm I've been doing daycare for like ten years now, but um, I just I take an activity, and that's how the planning really comes into place. And I take an activity, and sometimes I can make it you know fit for a toddler, but sometimes I make an make it more of a toddler activity, but still going in the same focus area. So that part, I actually, I really like the planning aspect of doing childcare because I always say that if I'm kind of a type A personality and I like to move a lot, but the part where I get to plan and figure out what ch children like and what I get to identify what I'm helping in different areas, that part of the job I really love. That's awesome. So it's not to work, but it, it, keeps, it keeps me busy, but I like it. That's awesome. Awesome. I would have to think that would be very difficult to do, <laughs> with, especially with that wide range of uh, age range, to make sure that you're getting each of those um, developmental milestones implemented. Yep. Thank you for sharing. So Anna, how how do you think that will affect, do you currently use the planning cycle as an ongoing process and how do you think it will affect your teaching practices?
Yes, I think that um, the planning cycle is a good reference tool um, to make sure that you have, um, when you do plan, that you have the different things to um, ensure that you're hitting each thing. So you have your identifying, your planning, implementing, observing, testing, assessing, and repeating each time. Um, so that is great. Thank you guys for sharing. And then, like I said, I was going to go over different um, types of observation. Um, the observation. So um, I talked, you know, a little bit about the last slide uh, and about observation. In chapter two, there was a whole section that was devoted to the methods of recording an observation. Um, so there are several different observational methods. Uh, in choosing an observation method, you, you must, inf must first determine what is that you want to learn from the observation, kind of, um, you know, going back to identifying. Uh, you want to make sure what you want to get out of um, your lesson plan, what do you want to get out of the observation, kind of similar. Um, so I did want to break down uh, each um, recording method of observation so you kind of have a little understanding of what they are and how they are used. So the very first thing, um, running record forms and anecdotal records are usually the most common forms of observation that teachers will use. Uh, running records are basically a detailed narrative account of behaviors or events written uh, sequentially as an incident occurs. Basically, it's kind of like a play-by-play -play of behaviors and events as it's happening. The anecdotal records are like a short story that educators use to record a significant incident that has... Um, that they observe can be written down after the behavior has taken place. So mm, one's kind of like a play-by-play -play action, the other one is kind of a narrative of a story. So that's kind of the difference between the running record and the editable record. The next thing that we have are checklists. So we have checklists. Um, are kind of more of a formal form of assessment that allows an educator to notate the presence or absence of some criteria with no details of the event. Um, basically, for example, we use like a 30 minute checklist uh, to ensure for, in our program to ensure that um, children are accounted for um, every 30 minutes, uh, usually that there's transitions um, that happened quite frankly, and we want to make sure that we have an age of face count. Um, so we use that form of checklist uh, in that manner. Um, there's a variety of checklists that people can, uh, teachers and programs can use. So um, that's just one of them. Uh, and then there's developmental checklists. Um, they are pretty much our assessment tools that list series of criteria to indicate the presence or absence of a specific behavior representative of children's development. Um, basically, you could find, for us, we use the Head Start uh, Learning Outcome Framework, um, it's basically assessment of what children should know at different ages and stages of their development. Um, a lot of state standards uh, have specifics of what children should know um, before uh, in preschool and kindergarten and so on. Um, so that is more developmentally checklist. Um, there's also questionnaires like stages uh, and stages questionnaires that um, sometimes they uh, teachers will do to, for assessment. There's also that gold assessment that I don't know if you guys are too familiar with. I know um, maybe a couple of you guys were familiar with the gold assessment. So 
there are different things um uh there are different things that you could use um as far as developmental checklists um so the next thing is uh the rating scale um so there's different rating scales uh for different programs um for our program we use the colorado shines it is basically it is a star it's like you get the highest is a five star basically it um tells you or gives you guidelines of what uh, your program's rated by um, teachers, by citation visits, uh, teacher credentials, trainings, um, just different things uh, for the actual program. And then they base you off of, uh, you know, with everything, if you meet the certain criteria, you get like a three star, a four star, a lot of for private companies um can charge more when they're when they have a really good rating because of the quality because usually the higher star a higher star rating equals more quality um so that's basically what rating scale entails and then there is time and event sampling kind of go hand in hand i guess um basically um time sampling um focuses on problem behaviors to see how often um they occur observers has set a time to observe the behavior and then they check how often the behavior occurs so that is kind of time sampling uh and then if and sampling is a series of short observations to confirm a child's behavior pattern in order to provide uh, suitable strategies to manage the child's behavior effectively. So basically, the event sampling, um, it confirms that the behavior is happening at different times throughout the day, um, not just at one um, specific time throughout the day. Um, so if you are viewing this online, Please answer the question below, uh, and I, um, Susan and Anna, uh, just want to hear a little bit about um, what you guys think. Uh, which observational approaches and documentation methods do you think that will be most effective to you, and why? I have used many of them before, I guess. I think I've taken two observation classes before. But the running record, I I think I do it, and it's something fun to even just share with parents to have, like, just an experience of what their child is maybe doing while they're doing it, and I can write down the stuff, and it just lets the parent get in their, uh, you know, just get in the moment of what the kid is doing. I've done checklists, say if I'm looking for stuff on the playground and stuff like that. Oh, look at how they can climb on this and stuff. I've done the time sampling and event sampling. I find it really helpful. Yep, like you said, when you're dealing with a struggling behavior or something. Uh, the rating scale, that one was more just talking about your program's rating, right? Yeah, basically yeah. that's what it is. Yep, we have that in Minnesota too. And Yep, and developmental checklists, I do that in the books that I evaluate them on. So I I like them all. Yeah, I, I think it was a bunch of different ones depending on what you're doing. And I think it was you, Susan, who said that you use teaching strategies goals. Yep. Yep, that's a really good tool to use. Um, I really expensive. like it. It's expensive, but it's good. <laughs> yep. Uh, I do the parent aware. So oh, okay. I did it for so years, so many years, and I did all these. I just kept taking so many hours of online training. I thought, why don't I just go back to college? <laughs> mm -hmm. but, yeah. Yeah. It really, really works good and lets me know exactly where I need to help the kids and each of them individually so I can map out what I'm doing. Yep. That's awesome to hear. Thanks, Susan. Yep. 
Uh, how about you, Anna? I don't know if you uh, if you can hear me or not, or if your audio is back on. Um, there, uh, what observational approaches or documentation methods do you think would be most useful for you, um, especially being in a volunteer role? Mm, anecdotal records. Uh, uh, you do learn a lot from others, and others, and what others go through, um, and event sampling and time sampling, I think, are going to be very helpful too. Yes. Uh, you, especially in this field, you'll see a lot of different behaviors. Um, some very good, some really not so good. <laughs> but um, it's you know, a lot of times we think that you know. Children are not trying to give, give you a hard time. Children are having a hard time um, because a lot of times they don't know how to um, communicate. So, you know, making sure that you have those methods of observation are really, really good to see. Um, you could really, really, it gives you a little bit more insight of how to best support them um, on an individual basis. Yes, having a child with um, a developmental delay, um, like autism or so forth, um, can be quite challenging. Um, and, you know, understanding their cues of um, their likes and dislikes is huge. It's really huge of how um, their day is going to go. Um, so, yeah. So, yeah, it's great that you are handling them and making sure that you have strategies um, in place so you're meeting their needs. All right. Um, I'm going to move on to learning objective using smart goals. Um, so in one of this week's assignments, <coughs> excuse me, you are to come up with a comprehensive lesson plan. Where all learning objectives must be stated as quote unquote smart goals objectives. So what are the smart goal objectives and how do we include that in our comprehensive assignment? First of all, I just wanted to review what the characteristics of the smart goal objective is. And then we will look at the example comprehensive lesson plan. Um, and I can just give you a little bit more detail of what it should look like. Um, so uh, you, when you're doing your um, smart goal um, learning objective, you want to really make sure that your goals are really specific of the children. Um, while you're upholding the program and early learning standards, the um, question is, do you know exactly what you want to accomplish? Um, and are the goal, the goals have to be defined? Um, so that's the very first thing um, when you are writing a learning objective in a SMART goal. Uh, the next thing is, how will you know the goal is met? Um, you want to make sure that you use formal assessment with the children of what will that and what will that look like I mean what does the child know after you've done something um, can they do it successfully can they not um, you know basically formal assessment um, making sure that um, kind of you know in you know like I think Susan explained about the balance beam if Johnny could do the balance beam but uh, Kimmy can, um, you know, making sure did we meet the goal, what kind of methods are we going to put in place um, so Kimmy can meet that. Uh, well, is it even DAP? Uh, you know, you want to make sure that um, you're planning for a child that is challenged, uh, that is a challenge, 
but still achievable. Um, making sure that um, you're not trying to have an infant use their feed themselves um, with fork while in spoons, um, or it could be more appropriate for a toddler slash preschooler to do that. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and is it realistic? Um, once again, you want to consider the AP. The individual child and their typical development, uh, you know, making sure that you're looking at your benchmarks for your state's early learning standards. Uh, like I said earlier, for Head Start, it's uh, early learning outcome framework for children with different ages and stages. Um, is your goal realistic and within the children's reach? Um, and then uh, the last thing that a lot of people, <laughs> that I see a lot of my students when I and they take this class, they usually forget um, is, a, is a timely one, will this goal be reached? Um, you always want to have some kind of timeline. Um, it could be a week, month, semester, whatever it is, but you want to make sure that you have a timeline just to ensure that um, it's being tracked and it's being measured. <coughs> Excuse me, I have a tickle in my throat. So having said that, like I said, this week you're going to have, um, you're writing a learning objective using SMART goals. Um, this is something I have done with my daughter, who is three and a half, who has developmental delays um, of what you're supposed to do. So basically, this is an example of it. Um, basically, Right here, you want to make sure that you put the student's name. Um, you want to make sure you initial it just for confidentiality purposes. Um, so when I did this, uh, we put her initials here, and the name of the activity was mealtime routine. Uh, we did this more of an individual uh, group size was individual age group when. I made this plan it was uh, 16 to 36 months. She's a little bit older than that now, so um, she could do a little bit of this stuff now. But basically, over here with the lesson objective goals, um, like I said, they should be all using the smart goals. So we want to look at physical uh, fine mortar and making sure that the goal line so we're doing this for meal time so use this hand-eye coordination when participating in routines such as carrying food eating with silverware drinking out of a cup pouring liquid into a cup and eating with fingers over here <coughs> use me um this is the domain of the activity uh how will the activity help you promote learning and growth in this domain? Here with physical, fine motor kind of goes hand in hand. Uh, providing um, opportunities to have Annika use fork, spoons, eat with fingers, smelling and touching foods, pour water in a cup, drink water from a cup. Carry food and passing food will help strengthen her mortar skills and hand eye coordination. So that is uh, the activity that we use. Um, for her to get her to wear to make sure that um, this is a goal and this is the activity that we're using. The next one is identify different foods in correlation to shapes, colors, and quantity during mealtime. And basically, identifying different foods by their shape and colors. Example, an apple is a red circle. Um, something to that extent. Uh, so that is that with intellectual um, seeks information in of words by asking questions in words such as or signs such as what's that, who's that, why, or what happened at mealtime. Basically, here is this implementation of visuals on a daily schedule board of the child eating at the table or reading specific books regarding mealtime and asking questions to scaffold their child's learning. 
um, basically with this, he, just really wanting to um, use as much vocab as vocabulary as possible during that time. Um, engages in positive interactions such as thank you, please excuse me, more please, no thank you, you're welcome, in a wide variety of situations with familiar adults. Um, so this, Annika will use po positive manners such as please, thank you. <coughs> This will be modeled by the adult, so Annika will know that is an appropriate and positive way of communicating. So basically, in this situation, we, as educators, we want to make sure that we do model for our children um, to ensure that we are then get there with their um, through the lesson plan, and then demonstrates awareness of own thoughts, feelings, preferences. After trying new foods, Annika will have awareness and feelings about the new foods that she tried. She will show emotion by trying new food. Um, you know, like sometimes he might try new food, like, um, uh, I don't know, grapefruit. And, you know, grapefruit is sour. Might have a sour look on her face. Um, something to that extent. So basically, that's a little bit of the comprehensive lesson plan. Um, it doesn't need to be exactly like this, but it's kind of showing you um, what your objective should be. And, and remember, with objectives, um, using SMART goals needs to begin with a verb. So if you take a look at the uses, identify, seek, engages, um, basically the child or the person you're lesson planning for are doing something. And then over here is just how that activity um, will promote the learning in each domain. So that is a little, that's a little bit about the comprehensive lesson plan. Um, now, do you guys have any questions for me about the information presented at this time? Um, you know, feel free if you don't have any questions at this time to, you can always email me, text me, um, do whatever you can to get a hold of me. I usually respond uh, pretty quick. I, I know the polo, college policy is like 48 hours, but I try to get to my students as soon as possible, um, just to make sure that um, uh, I can hear your guys' questions answered in a timely manner. Um, so yeah, and if you are viewing this online, please answer the questions um, that was in this live session. Uh, make sure that you guys get your discussion post done by 11.59 p.m. Central Standard Time tonight. Um, and I don't have anything else for you, Susan, uh, Anna, um, thanks for joining me night. Uh, thanks for your participation. Since you guys uh, were online, you guys will receive full credit for this uh, discussion or for this live session. Um, so yeah, thanks ladies and uh, have a good night. I have one quick question. What yeah, do we ahead, do when, we, when we log in to do our for watching the video, what do we respond for the answer format? For this? Yes. Nothing. I will, what I do is I will, um, I will override it, your grade and we'll make sure I'll get you a 10. You don't have to do anything on your end. Okay. Yep. Well, thank so, you very much. Have a nice yep. night. You too.